I'm watching this video. I tell you what, it's a system update by Glenn Greenwald on uh, Rumble. And, uh, I, you know, you can't steal much material. You can only steal a little bit and then put it in the context of what you're trying to, to point out. And I, in this video, he's talking about the fact that, you know, at, at first, Saddam Hussein was our friend in the, his war against Iran, and we gave him weapons and everything. And I, and then, you know, if you recall, I, I, later on, he became our enemy. And, you know, number one, we had to take him out and spend a trillion gazillion dollars to go over there. Of course, I was over there fighting. Didn't, you know, I guess back then I was kind of stupid. I didn't really put two and two together. You know, same thing with uh, Libya. We were friends with Gaddafi for a while, and then uh, then he became enemy number one, and we took him out. Uh, and then, of course, Bashar Assad in uh, Syria. So, you know, it's amazing. And what he's talking about is how the media, you know, being the propaganda arm of the Democrat Party, flip-flops. They'll flip-flop the whole narrative. What he's going to talk about eventually, and now I'm going to get to that snippet, is how we flip-flop the narrative on Ukraine. At one time, Ukraine was... was was an evil empire, just like they're making Russia out to be. And uh, they had uh, a lot of problems. But then Ukraine became our best friend, and we're going to spend $100 billion to help them out. So kind of listen into what he's saying here. And I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i have to edit this video because I can only take a couple of snippets. But I think this is very, very interesting. I encourage you to watch this on Rumble. How Ukraine is now talked about in the West versus how they were discussed, discussing that country for the eight years before Western populations needed to be convinced to send arms and massive amounts of their money there, even if it meant a proxy war, are risking a direct hot war over Ukraine with a nuclear armed power. To begin with, consider this documentary from the BBC in 2014. This is, this is good. Its title assumed, as if it weren't debatable, that in fact it was a basic truth, namely many Ukrainians do not want to live under the rule of Kiev. So what he's pointing out here is that uh, when Kiev, Kiev uh, supposedly, you know, I got to say that because uh, I wasn't there, but um, 90 95% of the people voted to become part of Russia. They didn't want to be part of, of Ukraine. So, and then the same in the Donbass region. Now, of course, you know, it would have been better if we had had uh, uh, neutral observers there. I'm not sure the UN is a neutral observer, but I think that it would have been nice to have them there for the, uh, uh, the election. Um, but uh, let's just listen a little further. Or even be citizens of Ukraine at all. Instead, they are Russian-speaking ethnic Russians whose families for centuries have self-identified as Russian, and they would much rather live under the rule of Moscow than Kiev, especially once the Ukrainian government was changed with the help of Victoria Nuland and her friends and became pro-EU instead of pro-Russian. All right, so I'm going to fast forward from there. Uh, if you're not familiar, back in 2014, there was there was there was a pro-Russian leader in Ukraine, and then a coup, basically a coup was staged. And you know, uh, Victoria Nealand, she keeps popping up. She was back there. Uh, she's a neocon, and uh, she was she was there during. Uh, well, honestly, because all the way maybe back to the Clinton administration. I don't know, but she was definitely there during the Obama years. And then, uh, and then she she got taken out by Trump, and then now she's back there again. Uh, under Biden, now maybe she's not there now. <laughs> not with the not with the country getting destroyed. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause the video right there, and then I'll, I'm gonna fast forward to the the next thing that he talked about, because uh, you know one of the things that I was real curious about was you know Russia when they went in, they kept saying they're gonna denazify Ukraine, and I uh, I didn't know I you know I I knew there were Nazis in Ukraine, but I didn't really understand what that was all about you know you hear about them well you don't hear about them in the news now go search on google you won't even find the azov a-z-o-v azov battalion uh because that's been erased from history you know and then that by the way that was another good thing that he did was he started out talking about the book 1984 and the way the book way it worked in the book was like okay they would get everybody to fight this enemy and then they would rewrite history and then they would say, okay, no, nope, this is our enemy over here. And they would make them out to be the bad guys. And then they'd fight over here. And then they would say, well, this country was allied with that country. And it just went around and around. And, uh, and, and the people that, you know, were fighting in the war, like the character in there, he was, he was going, wait a minute, my reality four years ago, everything's flipped completely around, which is, you know, if you don't really pay attention to it, it is amazing how the mainstream media, or I'm hoping they're the legacy media, 
follows in lockstep with the narrative, you know, and, and so if they, if they want Ukraine to be a bad guy, Ukraine becomes a bad guy. If they want Ukraine to be a good guy, they make Ukraine a good guy. And we're going to get to get to it here. So we're, uh, there's a, it's actually, I see an end video on the Azov Italia back when they used to actually kind of report some news uh, before they became the uh, propaganda arm of the Democrat Party. So Glenn goes on uh, with the video and, uh, and he was talking about it. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, we always knew that the Donbass region was in, well, if you want to say civil war uh, or a Russian separatist, I've uh, been fighting uh, the Ukrainians for quite some time. And so we've been basically, I mean, he didn't say this, but this is what I'm saying is that, you know, we've been basically fighting a proxy war in Ukraine against Russia for quite some time. It's just that, uh, you know, Russia, I guess they just had enough of it because, um, and that and that tells you if, if the U Ukrainians in the Donbass region, because they, they, they really wanted to be independent. I don't, I'm not sure if they wanted to be part of Russia, but they certainly didn't want to be part of Ukraine or they wouldn't have been fighting. You know, when you're fighting, you're dying, you know, and if you believe in your cause so much, you're willing to die for it. That means they really, really didn't want to be part of Ukraine. But if they, and he's pointing out that the narrative right now, if you follow the media, Definitely Russia was the aggressor and everybody in Ukraine wants to be part of Kiev. And then so the other thing that I always always, you know, I, it didn't, you know, sometimes you, you, get, it's, you need somebody to beat you over the head was, OK, why are we so interested in Ukraine? Well, we just had the uh, uh, what the FTX scandal. OK, and what, what we found out was that a lot of that money was uh, was sent to Ukraine then the, the money was laundered in Ukraine and then sent back to the Democrat Party. So you see, it's a, so Ukraine has is, is, is been this huge money laundering uh, place. And so that's why we're sending so much of our taxpayer money, because the oligarchs uh, around the world, and especially here in the United States, they're, lo they're losing their money laundering um, nation. So, I mean, there's other places that are going to be able to launder money, but Ukraine has been been... The, the golden goose that just kept on giving. So, and of course, a lot of this money that we're spending to help Ukraine with the war is going to get laundered back to the Democrat Party and the military industrial complex to a certain degree. So let's listen to the money laundering because he breaks it down. And I, so when you, when, you, when you put two and two together about why we're spending $100 billion, number one, that money is going to get laundered back to the neocons, maybe some rhinos and the Democrats, a lot of it. And anyway, and so that's why they want to send, send all of our taxpayer money over there. They, they're getting rich off of the war. Now, the question of what people in eastern Ukraine want is by far not the only topic where everything has changed. Let's take a look at the hero's welcome that President Zelensky just oh. received when he... All right, dag on it. I went too far back. All right, I'm, I hope I'm not borrowing too much material spoke to a joint house of, of Congress and he draped the dais of the House of Representatives. Man, that was disgusting. I'm going to tell you, I, I was going, I just was looking at that like, oh my God, I thought Nancy Pelosi was going to grab him by the mouth and just kiss him, you know? So, oh, yeah. In Ukraine. It was insane. And let's compare it to what has been said about him over the last several years since he emerged in power. First of all, let's start with this Guardian article. This is it. This is it. As you may recall, there was a leak of millions of documents a decade ago called the Panama Papers. You know, and I didn't even know about these Panama Papers. Did you? I don't. I don't remember it even being even reported on in the news. And this is why Glenn Greenwald. I mean, I tell you what. It, there was a reason that Edward Snowden gave Glenn Greenwald the uh, all of the uh, paper about the NSA. I mean, the guy's a bang up reporter, man which revealed how rich people hide their wealth in offshore uh, bank accounts where it's free from accounting or detection or taxes. And there was a subsequent sequel to that called the Pandora Papers, which did much of the same. And as this Guardian article in 2021, just six months or five months before Russia invaded Ukraine, it became prohibited to say anything negative about Zelensky in the West, as the Guardian noted, quote, revealed anti-oligarch Ukrainian president's offshore connections. They put anti-oligarch in quotes because they were mocking the fact that Zelensky was posing as someone opposed to oligarchy and corruption when he himself, as revealed by these papers, had all sorts of offshore accounts. The, the article read. So you got to watch the Glenn Greenwald video. 
Um, but he goes on to describe, I didn't realize what a master money launderer Zelensky is. And by the way, Zelensky is rich. I didn't even know, know that, you know. I mean, I knew that he was making a lot of money off of the war. I guarantee you, Zelensky won't be there <laughs> when the Russians enter Kiev. He's going to be drinking pina coladas in the Bahamas somewhere, just like uh, Sam was, uh, Sam Beckman, or whatever that damn kid's name that just stole billions of dollars. Because Zelensky, it sounds like, he's stolen billions of dollars too, and that's what these papers point out. And, uh, of course, Glenn Greenwald goes into all the details in the papers to show how many millions and, and how Zelensky is offshored a lot of this money from Ukraine to other countries. Very, very interesting, very interesting. But this is the part that I really wanted to get to because he's going to talk about who, what countries are using Ukraine as a money laundering scheme. And I thought this was very interesting. Here we go. Investigative journalists about those papers, and you can see here the countries most mentioned in the Pandora Papers, documents that prove how extremely wealthy people in politics hide their wealth because they don't want it to be detected. And there you see Ukraine has the lead by far as the most mentioned, as the country with the most politicians named in these papers with 38. And Russia, who we never stop hearing about in terms of their corruption, corruption and oligarchs, has exactly half, 19. And then there are the rest of the countries. Here is, uh, so before we get to the, the U.S. Department of State. So I... Um, I I don't want to get it on the video, but it's the United Arab Emirates, Honduras, Colombia, Nigeria, UK, Brazil, and Angola. So those are all the top countries. Ukraine being by far <laughs> the best money laundering country in the world. Uh, so let me, let me just get a little more. Let's see. He went back. What we're being told is that Zelensky is this noble figure who fought off oligarchy. People will acknowledge that Ukraine is still corrupt, but they say that he has been elected on a, a platform of reform to fight oligarchy. But anyway, so he goes on to even describe, you know, because you got to remember Zelensky was just an actor. So how is he a billionaire now? <laughs> I, mean, you know, I wonder how that happened. I, I don't know. Could have you did you make a billion dollars by uh, just being an actor? I don't know. I, I don't know too many. Maybe Tom Cruise. Who knows? But this is going to tell you exactly what's been going on in Ukraine. It's a totalitarian state. Despotism on the other in Russia. That is something that we hear constantly, but it's not something we heard until Russia stepped foot into Ukraine in, in, in 2022 and the West saw an opportunity to weaken Russia by backing Ukraine. Here, for example, is the report of the Department of State in 2021 under Joe Biden. This is the report on human rights practices. And it reports on the practices in Ukraine. And again, this is a government, the United States, already very favorably inclined to Ukraine. It was governing it. It picked its leaders. It was arming and supporting yeah, it. I might have went back too far again. That. This is what they were willing that to good. say about Ukraine prior to the Russian invasion. Quote, significant human rights abuse issues include credible reports of unlawful and arbitrary killings, including extrajudicial killings by the government or its agents, torture in cases of cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment of detainees by law enforcement personnel, harsh and life-threatening prison conditions, arbitrary arrest or detention, serious problems with the independence of the judiciary, serious abuses in the Russia-led conflict in the Donbass, including physical abuses of punishment of civilians and members of armed groups held in detention facilities, serious restrictions on free expression and media, including violence or threats of violence against journalists, unjustified arrest or prosecution of the journalists and censorship, serious restrictions on internet freedom, Refoulement of refugees to a country where they would face a threat to their life or freedom. Serious acts of government corruption, lack of investigation of and accountability for gender-based violence, crimes, violence, or threats of violence motivated by anti-Semitism, crimes involving violence or threats of violence targeting persons with disabilities, members of ethnic minority groups, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or intersex persons, and the existence of the worst forms of child labor. So that's where your tax money's going. <laughs> it just blows my mind. I mean, I knew about a lot of that. Uh, and that's, and I guess the point of his, his video, and you, when you really think about it, this was Ukraine before Russia invaded. 
And, and look at the way Ukraine's being reported on now. Zelensky, I thought Nancy Pelosi was going to give him a kiss right there on the, on the floor of Congress. And now, now Ukraine is this, this saintly state that is, that is fighting this, this uh, terrible war against the Russian bear, you know. And anyway, I just wanted to, to point this out. There's one more thing that we're going to get to in this video. I know it's getting a little long, and I, I'm stealing a lot from, from Glenn. Actually, it's, I mean, this is a long video, so I'm really not, not stealing that much, and I'm trying to give you my slant on everything, too. Um, but let's, let's just keep going. Okay, we're getting, getting to the, the meat of what I'm going to name this video. But anyway, I, you know, I cut it off right there, but I mean, he put on with the whole litany of stuff that does, uh, the Zelensky government has done. Uh, shutting down uh, three opposition TV stations, banning churches, uh, the, orth the Orthodox Church, torture. You know, I mean, you name it. I mean, this is the, the brutality of what was going on in Ukraine was just insane. And that was a year before the war. OK, now they're the most saintly country that ever existed. You see how the narrative flopped? And, you know, and, and all you're going to hear about is how wonderful Ukraine is. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm. And I'm just following, but I knew a lot of this stuff because I, I knew it was being reported on back then. It's just I didn't know the extent to how evil this, this, this government is. And this is why a lot of people in Ukraine wanted uh, Russia to, to, they wanted to live under Russian rule. They wanted to get the hell out of Ukraine. I don't blame them. I mean, I'm sure Russia's not that much better to live in, but it's got to be better than what I'm seeing about Ukraine. Now, this is the part that I really want you to hear. Well, I tell you, you got <laughs> I don't know how in the world he puts all this stuff together. I mean, this, good Lord, this must be an hour-long video. I'm trying to summarize it for you. So he goes on to, uh, and the same thing I was pointing out, is that uh, just a few years ago, uh, um, Facebook has a policy that you can uh, expunge uh, white supremacy and neo-Nazism on their platform. Well, guess what? That all changed <laughs> when, the, when the war started. Now the Azov Battalion has uh, been exempted and uh, they can post all over Facebook all they want, uh, which is amazing to me. And uh, of course, he cites many other examples of uh, the reporting on the Azov Battalion, but this is the one that I found the most interesting. I was trying to think, was it? Oh, yeah. The, the other thing was, remember when, um, what's that idiot that we've got? Uh, I don't know, I can't remember his name, but he says, white supremacy is the number one problem we have in the United States. Well, here we are, we're funding a bunch of Nazis and, and white supremacists in Ukraine with billions of dollars of military equipment and billions of dollars of our, our taxpayer money. Riddle me that, Batman. Riddle me that. It, oh my God, it just goes on. It, you know, and how the narrative has changed. Um, and it used to be the FBI had these guys on their terrorist watch list. I guess not anymore, although I wouldn't want anybody from the Azov Battalion over here in the United States, I can tell you that. And by the way, the, the other thing that he was pointing out that I found interesting, that's exactly what I ran into, was when you find articles now in the Azov Battalion, they just say it's a small, you know, unit in, in the Ukrainian military, you know, uh, and then they've, they've toned it down. They don't call them neo-Nazis or uh, white supremacists anymore. They just say, you know, they're just a small unit. No, the Azov Battalion was the largest military force in Ukraine. Maybe not anymore now that Russia's been beating the tar out of them. I don't know. But I mean, you know, so, so you, when you read, you know, stuff, I mean, that's how the, the narrative has changed. They're saying, oh, the Azov Battalion is just part, you know, part of, part of uh, Ukraine's military no, they were the biggest part of their military. So let's keep going. This, this, is the, this is the most interesting part, and then I'll finish off the video right here. About how dangerous and Nazi-ish the Azov Battalion was. Look what they did. Through the summer of 2019, and I've gone to Ukraine to learn more about these groups. From the crowds, one thing seemed pretty clear about them. They weren't bothered by the fact that this event was organized by the Azov movement, a far-right group that has increasingly been linked to violence around the world. FBI agents say he expressed a desire to travel to Ukraine to fight with a far-right paramilitary group. At least one member of an American hate group also trained in Ukraine with Azov Battalion. What worries officials in the West is Azov's recruitment strategy. It's tried hard to build friendships with far-right groups around the world, especially in the U.S. and Europe. During my visit in 2019, I spent a day at one of the biggest recruitment events in Azov's history. 
Thousands of people showed up for a day of fighting sports and blatant propaganda. There were neo-Nazi symbols, tattoos, and posters all over the place. And many in the crowd seemed pretty receptive to Azov's far-right ideology. That's from Time Magazine, January 7th, 2021. Amazing how that narrative changed, didn't it, once uh, Russia went in. That's Time Magazine. Now, I bet right now they're probably saying Azov, you know, guy walks your grandmother across the street and gives them a bouquet of flowers. I'm going to listen just one more second to Glenn, and then we'll, we'll finish off the video right there. Um, by the way, he, he does go into the Twitter files later on in the video. I found that very interesting, but that's not the purpose of this video. But I just wanted to summarize all of this. Let's, let's just finish out. I love the way he summarizes all that. Time Magazine, 20, January 7, 2021. Now, look, maybe you're somebody who thinks that the U.S. should continue to send weapons, sophisticated weaponry, some of the most sophisticated weapons in the world, even though it will end up in the hands of a neo-Nazi group called the Azov Battalion. Maybe you're somebody who wants the U.S. involved in defending Russia, defending Ukraine, rather, even though... The president of Ukraine is incredibly corrupt in the way that the Pandora Papers showed he was. Maybe you're somebody who believes that the U.S. government should treat Ukraine as a proxy war, even though the Ukrainian government is incredibly despotic and abusive and has very little relationship to what we think of as democratic. All right, that's it for the video. But I mean, well, if you're a Democrat, that's what you want. <laughs> I just love picking on them. All right, so that's it for the video. I just thought that I'd try to kind of show you how the our media is just so unbelievable. You know, nobody watches these videos, but uh, I hope that, you know, the three people that do, you know, I figure if I educate one person, then that's one person that might, uh, might not have known otherwise. So anyway, peace out, stay free, um, and it's good, 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 good to live in the free, free, free state of Florida. I'll watch some more. Maybe I'll tack on something else, but I think that's about it. I think he switches over to the Twitter files at this point. But this is the best reporting that I've seen on Ukraine and the narrative and the media and relating it to the book 1984. I mean, this, hell, I, he should make a movie out of this doggone video. I mean, this is just one, I, man, this greatest reporting ever.